Okay, we begin our next major unit here after the last exam on waves and sound that leads directly into a description of light. Specifically here, we now begin to take a look at optics. Light is a wave. Okay, now, so recall some of the basic properties associated with mechanical waves. Mechanical waves, for example, reflect they refract or transmit, they diffract, which I'll get to in this unit a little bit later on, and they also interfere. So recall some of the basic properties of mechanical waves. Reflection, Refraction. Okay, what's called diffraction, which as I said, I'll get to a little bit later on. And interference. Now, if light is a wave, it should also have these properties as well. What I want you to do at this point is pause the lecture and then take a look at the simple demonstration videos that I have posted for you on refraction, reflection, and then also what is called Young's experiment. Young's experiment is the definitive experiment or demonstration that shows that light is a wave. It shows the interference of light. So go ahead and take a look at those demonstration videos now. Okay, now that you've looked at those demonstration videos here, let me now go through an explanation of Young's experiment. As I said in that video, Young's experiment, the definitive demonstration that light is a wave, is designed to measure the wavelength of light. Okay, so Young's experiment. We're in the early 19th century. It's a demonstration. of light and it is kind of the definitive demonstration that light is a wave. Definitively demonstrates that light is a wave. Okay, so the experiment itself is designed to measure the wavelength of light. And it's a situation that we've seen before. It's a situation involving two source interference, which was briefly covered in the last unit in the ripple tank. So at this point, what I want you to do is pause the lecture and then take a look at the screencast video that I've posted for you showing two source interference once again in the ripple tank. But in this case, what I do in that demonstration of a screencast is I produce the interference pattern by taking plane waves and having those plane waves incident upon two very closely spaced holes referred to as slits. So go ahead and take a look at that screencast now. Okay, now that you've seen that screencast, here is then ultimately how the pattern itself is produced. Okay, so first of all, the experiment itself is drawn out in the following way, and we also have some def definitions associated with it. Okay, first of all, the vertical slits themselves are usually drawn like this. So here's one vertical slit in this direction, here's the other in this direction. Okay, they're separated by a distance here. This re distance is referred to as small d. Okay, now exactly what is the distance small d? For example, is it from here to here or is it from here to here? Well, one of the things that we're ignoring for simplicity here in our description of Young's experiment is the size of each individual slit itself. We're going to consider each individual slit to be a point 
So then therefore the distance d is just the difference, or the distance rather, from one point to the other. Okay, d is an experimental control. As you saw in my demonstration video of Young's experiment, the spacing between the two slits themselves is extremely small. Okay, and then we draw an axis like so that is perpendicular to the slits. And then right here is what is generically referred to as the screen. Okay, the screen is basically the whiteboard where you actually saw the actual demonstration itself, where you saw the interference pattern. Okay, the distance then from the slits to the screen is usually referred to as capital L. Capital L is the distance basically from one side of the room to the other here in the demonstration that you saw. L is gigantic compared to small d. That's very important later on. Okay, and then the pattern itself here forms on the screen. So for example, you see this bright spot here right in the center of the pattern, this bright fringe. This is referred to as the central maximum. And then you see the alternating pattern of bright and dark fringes, antinodes and nodes, symmetrically on either side of the central maxima. So the next bright fringe, for example, is here and here. The next one after that is here and here. And then eventually the pattern itself dims out as you begin to move to the sides. Okay, let's, let's pick rather a particular point on the screen. For example, like so. This is usually referred to as point P. And then we have a distance here on the screen from that point P to the center of the central maximum. <coughs> that distance right here is referred to as Y. Y is something that can be easily measured. L and D are experimental controls. Okay, we're also going to define an angle here on the diagram as well. I'm going to do so by drawing a line here from the center of the two slits to that point P on the screen itself. This angle right here is referred to as theta. Theta is really tiny. You'll see this numerically in my example, and we'll also use it later on to make a small angle approximation. But the angle theta is tiny. Okay, notice on the diagram, however, that the tangent of theta is equal to y over l. Okay, now ultimately here's how the pattern itself gets produced. Let me do some erasing here. So this is basically what you saw in the screencast demonstration here using the ripple tank applet. All right, so once again, right here are the two slits, axis and screen and so forth. And now think of the slits here as source one and source two. Okay, and then we assume that we have incident plane waves of light that are incident upon the two slits. How do you produce those plane waves of light? Well, we'll get to that a little bit later on by using Huygens' principle, which was also, also briefly touched upon in the last unit. So right here from the laser, for example, are plane waves of light that are an incident here upon the two slits. And then each individual slit behaves as a point source of circular wavelets, once again by using Huygens' principle. So then therefore propagating outwards from source number one, this hole, if you will, are circular light waves like so. Propagating outwards here from hole number two, source two, are circular light waves like so. And then the circular light waves here, they begin to encounter one another, and then therefore they begin to interfere. The actual interference pattern itself is present here in the room. You can see this, for example, in the ripple tank screen, uh, screencast that I've posted for you. But when you actually look at the pattern itself, you don't see the pattern in the room. The reason for that essentially is twofold. Number one, the dimness of the laser light here in the room, well, it's extremely dim. So then therefore, in order to actually see the red light here in the room itself, what I would have to do is like rain chalk dust from the ceiling or something like that. And I'm certainly not going to do that. In addition to that, you can see the individual waves themselves, of course, when you take a look at the ripple tank interference pattern. And that's because the speed of water waves, for example, is quite small. Here in this case, we're talking about the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. That's a very important number, by the way, later on in this class. But for now, the reason why you can't see the actual waves themselves here in the room is because they're just propagating too quickly. 
But basically what you then see are all the waves effect, if you will, as they pile up on each other here on the screen, resulting in the alternating pattern of bright and dark fringes. So it's the exact same interference pattern as the ripple tank experiment. It's just in this case, you only see the interference pattern itself on the screen. That's how it gets produced. Okay, now, once again, the experiment itself is, or is designed rather to measure the wavelength of light. So now let's go ahead and get to the math associated with the pattern itself. All right, so mathematically. Okay, so what we do is we take a look at the conditions that are necessary where at some point on the screen to produce either a bright fringe, an antinode, or dark fringe, a node. The conditions necessary to produce either a bright or dark fringe are exactly the same as it was to produce an antinode or a node in the ripple tank interference pattern. So then therefore we have the following. Okay, so condition necessary to produce a bright fringe. Oops, bright fringe. Which is an antinode. Okay, so we draw the experiment once again like so. L, D, like so. And then we have source one and source two. And then let's say, for example, right here is our point P on the screen. We want to produce a bright fringe at that point. It's actually the center of one of the bright fringes. That's the actual anti-node. That's the region of total constructive interference. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and draw some lines here on this diagram. Okay, right here is this distance from S1 to point P. Let me draw that a little bit better. Like so. This distance here is referred to as R1. Okay, and then we have the distance that source two is from point P like so. Okay, this distance right here is referred to as R2. Okay, and then I'm gonna draw a dotted line like so such that they form right here the difference between R2 and R1. This is referred to, once again, as the path length difference. In other words, the distance between my two fingers here is exactly the same as the distance between my two fingers here. Therefore, this distance right here is the difference between R2 and R1. So once again, this is called the path length difference. This is called delta R. R2 minus R1. Okay, now to get a bright fringe at point P, the following has to happen. So for example, let's say that coming out of S1 right at this moment is a sine curve, like so, associated with light. At the exact same time, coming from this point right here has to be another sine curve that's exactly in phase with the first one. Such so that these two sine curves, then these two waves travel the same distance in the same amount of time and they arrive at point P together in phase to produce a bright fringe. Once again, an antinode, a region of total constructive interference. The only way that that can happen is that within the path length difference here, for example, we would have to have a multiple of wavelengths. So let's say, for example, right here is a single wavelength like so. Notice that the space delta R here is equal to one wavelength. Or I could have two wavelengths or three wavelengths, et cetera, et cetera. So the condition necessary then in order to form a bright fringe, an antinode, is that in the space delta R, we have to have a multiple of wavelengths. When n is equal to zero, that just simply means that R1 and R2 are the same distance. That would occur right here, dead center in the pattern. That's obviously where the central maximum forms. And then when n is equal to one, that's the first bright fringe on either side of the interference pattern. When n is equal to 2, it's the second bright fringe on either side of the interference pattern, and so on, and so on, and so on. The value of n, this integer multiplier, is sometimes referred to as the order. So the first order fringe is the first fringe on either side of the central maximum. The second order fringe is the second fringe, etc., etc., etc. So that's the meaning here behind this integer multiplier. 
Okay, now this expression here allows us to measure the wavelength of light. For example, the value of n can be found by just looking at the pattern itself. So n is equal to zero for the central maximum, n equals one, and so on and so on. So then therefore finding the n is easy, all you literally have to do is look at the pattern itself. What about the path length difference? How do you measure that? Because if we can measure the path length difference, then we can go ahead and measure the wavelength of the light itself. So how do you find delta R? Here's how we find delta R. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this portion of the diagram here and I'm gonna blow it up such that it becomes really large. Notice that I have right here on the diagram a little triangle. Here's then how we describe that triangle. Okay, first of all, once again here, the slits themselves are separated by a distance D, and then point P is way off in the distance here somewhere. Remember from earlier, as I said, that L is much, much greater than D. Okay, now I've got my two blue lines on the top board for R1 and R2. R1 is going off in this direction, R2 is going off in this direction, and then I'm also gonna draw here this line here that you saw earlier in my definitions, the diagram that ultimately formed the angle theta. Now, because L is much, much larger than D, geometrically, what could you say about these three lines? They're very nearly parallel to each other. So because they're parallel, when I form the path length difference like so, this right here is a right angle. So what I end up with right here is a little right triangle. Let me go ahead and blow up that right triangle for our purposes to examine it a little bit more closely. So right here is that right triangle, or right here is the right angle. What is what on this triangle? Well, right here, the hypotenuse of the triangle, this right here is the distance D between the two slits. That's an experimental control. Right here is what we're trying to find. This right here is the path length difference delta R. And then in my previous diagram describing the definitions, this angle right here was the angle theta. If you futz around with the geometry here enough, you can show that the angle theta on the diagram from earlier is the same thing as this angle right here. That is like so, blown up on my diagram. And now we'll just use a little bit of sine. Notice that the sine of theta is equal to delta R divided by D. So the path length difference is D sine theta. And now for our last step, this is where we make the small angle approximation. So recall in the small angle approximation, the sine of theta and the tangent of theta are about the same thing. And then go back in your notes for a moment and take a look at the definitions diagram once again. Recall that tangent theta was y over l. So let's go ahead and replace the sine of theta here with the tangent of theta and then write that as y over l. That then gives you the following. The path length difference is dy over l. D and L are experimental controls, and Y is simply a distance that you measure on the screen from the central maximum. So then therefore, if you measure what Y is, and in the expression above, you know what N is, L and D are experimental controls, then you can find the wavelength of light. The expression on the top board now with delta R on the left-hand side of the expression written as dy over L gives you this. So, so you could directly then use this expression here to measure the wavelength of light. That's essentially what Thomas Young did in the early 19th century. Now, I've been describing all of this to you thus far by using bright fringes. Here's what happens for the dark fringe situation. 
Okay, I'm basically going to redraw this diagram here in just a moment. But now, this is the condition necessary to produce a dark fringe. So a dark fringe is a node that's a region of total destructive interference. Once again, this is described exactly the same way as it is with the two-source interference pattern in the ripple tank. Okay, now in this context, it looks like this. Okay, so right here is L once again, right here is the distance D, and then right here, for example, is our point P on the screen. Now we want to get a node at point P. Okay, right here is R1, right here is R2, and then once again I'll form right here the path link difference delta R on the diagram. Now, in order to get the waves to cancel each other out at point P, the following then therefore has to happen. Let's say, for example, that I have a sine curve coming out of S1 here right at that moment. And then coming out of S2, specifically at this point right here, has to be a negative sine curve, exactly 180 degrees out of phase with respect to the first. Such that these two waves then travel the same distance in the same amount of time, they arrive at point P together, pi radians out of phase, and then therefore they cancel each other out. So you end up with a dark fringe, you end up with a node at point P. This can only happen if this space right here, delta R, is equal to a half wavelength, or one and a half wavelengths, or two and a half wavelengths, etc., etc. So odd multiples of half wavelengths is what the path length difference has to be. We write the odd multiplier in the following way. So notice how the odd multiplier here works. When n is equal to zero, you then just have one times lambda over two, which is what I drew here. This is actually the first dark fringe, the first order dark fringe on either side of the central maximum. And then when n is equal to one, then you end up with three here inside the parentheses. This would be the next order dark fringe. And then when n is equal to two, you end up with five half wavelengths and so on and so on and so on. So you end up with this little expression here for the path length difference to find the nodes, the dark fringes. Once again, however, the delta r here, the path length difference, is the same thing as it was before, it's dy over l. So then therefore the expression that you end up with describing the dark fringes is this expression here. Either of the two expressions, that is for the bright fringes still over there on the right-hand board, or here for the dark fringes, this could be used then to measure the wavelength of light. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pause here as part one of today's lecture. I'll get to part two in just a moment.